Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Okay, usually I've got the show all lined up and I know I had a whole this summer that I ended up taking a week off with. Um, in fact, this week also, I ended up with a week off because of a last minute cancellation. I do have a bunch of episodes uh, set for September. A few of them are already recorded, but they're tied around publishing dates. So I didn't want to pull anything forward. In fact, next week's has already been recorded with Caleb Crane, which is a, a fun conversation. But that meant I could either take a second week off this summer or... We could do a Gil Roth Ask Me Anything episode, and uh, that's the route I decided to go. I last did one of these for episode 100 with the idea that it was going to be a great anniversary thing for people to hear um, me. This time around, it is episode 333, which I'm sure has some cabalistic significance, and um, we get more than two dozen of my past guests and some Patreon supporters sending me in questions over the last two days. I'm going to try and tackle as many as I can in a single take, which uh, should be pretty entertaining for my voice. Let's see where it goes. Now, our first several questions um, are all sort of overlapping, and I can understand why it's a great question to ask. Um, in fact, we'll let Ken Crimstein ask it. Ken is the author of The Three Escapes of Hannah Arendt, a graphic novel about Hannah Arendt. Hi, Gil. Uh, this is Ken Crimstein calling in from Evanston. And uh, question, after interviewing so many people, so many creative people, uh, w is there one thing that you think connects them all or that they have in common? Uh, everybody does such different things and such personal things, but what do you think it is about all the people that you've interviewed maybe that is something in common? And uh, have a great day. I'm avoiding work on my next book right at this very moment. Uh, looking forward to the show. Bye. Uh, Ken's question was mirrored by Hugh Ryan, uh, author of When Brooklyn Was Queer, who wrote, you get to talk to so many people about writing. Are there any over overarching craft lessons that have emerged from all these conversations? Similarly, Barry Corbett, um, who you can find his graphic memoir, Terminal Velocity, at IndiePlanet.com, wrote, Have you noted any common characteristics shared by creators you've interviewed? I know that's a great question. I'm probably, well, it seems like I'd be a good person to ask, but since all of this is about people who have actually gone ahead and created something, as opposed to me, um, and I mean that in terms of works of art, I understand the podcast is a creation, et cetera, et cetera, um, there isn't a whole lot of super common elements beyond do the work. All of them sat down. They did the work. Some of them, you know, it was part of their professional life. Some of them um, were driven by a, a knowledge that their work was, you know, it had to be out there. Some of them were deluded and, and kept pushing anyway. I'm just kidding. But they all they all worked. They all kept doing the work, uh, usually in the face of rejection. Um, in fact, just this morning, I, I spent a couple of hours with a past pod guest, not going to mention by name, but he's been researching and writing a massive novel for the past two years or so. And it really is an immense amount of work. It ties into a, um, a very complex family history he has. It's tied into the, the history of the 19th and 20th centuries and our present day. Um, 
And when I first zapped him, because he'd, he'd moved to the general region from somewhere else for a, a year, year and a half ago, and we kept saying we'd get together sometime, and I finally zapped him saying, hey, let's get together this weekend. I pitched a time in the morning, and he gave me a later time in the morning and said, I got to get my three hours in. And I didn't know what he meant. Um, he meant three hours of writing in the morning um, before doing research and other work and then getting back to writing in the evening. So it's all about working. Now, yeah, you could call the podcast um, a creation or art or something too. And yes, it involves work. Um, what this is involves the reading, researching, writing questions, pitching guests, all the post-production work, the website work, um, you know, everything that goes into it. Those are more technical or almost routine as opposed to creating art. But the common aspect here is you have to do the work. I, I think the guests who make it a regular practice, who have a regular um, routine, maybe are more productive. I mean, all of them say you can't just wait for the muse. You've got to go ahead and work. And some of them for whom this is also a profession, that's simply not an option. Anyway, the overarching characteristic here is they all work. Now, Barry, Barry Corbett, also asks, or he mentions, I was fascinated to hear that so many of the comics people had drifted away for a number of years and then returned to the field. I had the same experience, and I wondered if it was the same for writers, by which he means prose writers. I can't think of any who were out of writing and then came back or out of publishing. Like, if there's a big gap, it's usually because they were... They were writing and they were busy working, but they weren't publishing. So they fall out of out of, you know, the public eye, I suppose. So that's the lesson learned section. Um, the next question comes from Joe Chardello, and it's similar to one from Glennis Fox. Uh, Joe is a, a renowned illustrator, most recently the author of A Fistful of Drawings, an amazing collection of his illustrations and a narrative about the Italian-American experience and his experience with Westerns. Joe writes, not sure if it's something you want to get into, but I imagine there are, there are a few folks curious about your day gig. Also, and I imagine you covered this before, what inspired you to set up a podcast? Now, Glennis Fox, uh, author of the forthcoming Charlotte Bronte Before Jane Eyre, writes, I'd like to know how you got into comics and literature, or vice versa, how you got into pharmaceuticals, and how your two lives go along side by side. Those are good questions. Um, the pharma thing, let me give the, the attempt at a quick story. 20 years ago, in 1999, the editor-in-chief of the business-to-business -business magazine company I was working for uh, walked into my office. Now, at the time, I was under him as the managing editor of a uh, I think bi-monthly cosmetic packaging and design magazine. And um, Tom walked in and said, good news, you're not working for me anymore. Bad news, we're launching a pharmaceutical contract manufacturing trade magazine and you're going to be running it. Here's the business plan. Go figure this out. The first issue is coming out in about four months. And so I, with no pharmaceutical background, scientific experience or anything of that, that kind, started reading this business plan, figuring out what was what. And... Um, wound up as the founding editor of Contract Pharma magazine. Um, it was the idea for it came from two salespeople who didn't want to pursue the idea at their own company. They jumped to our company with the idea. Their editor got cold feet, and that's how I got press ganged into it. Over 15 years, I did a really good job um, providing all the editorial and shaping the magazine and um, making good relationships with these contract manufacturers in the pharma space. By contract manufacturers, I mean the guys who make the drugs for the drug companies. So they're not the guys who have anything to do with drug pricing or weird clinical trials or anything like that. I sort of liken them to the printers that a publisher uses. So the, the publisher sends the content out to a printer, they print the book, etc. But the printer has nothing to do with the contents, nothing to do with the pricing, etc. So... 15 years of that, um, I started to wonder about, first, the viability of the business-to-business -business, uh, magazine model going forward, because internet. And second, I sort of realized that this weird little industry needed some sort of representation and a group voice with um, with the FDA, with Congress, etc. 
because they had no trade association. So um, this long story can get slightly shorter. Beginning of 2014, I quit my job at the magazine, organized them into a trade association, did all the filings and paperwork to become a nonprofit, build a board of trustees, etc., um, convinced FDA to bring us into this multi-billion dollar negotiation that I did not realize was going to be multi-billion dollar when I started it. Um, and then over the course of that time, managed to bring in a whole lot more companies into the, the membership. I had to register as a lobbyist with the federal government as part of this because we had to start talking to Capitol Hill about the stuff we were doing with FDA, et cetera. So um, that's sort of the day job. I run a trade association. I bring contract manufacturers in the pharma space together. It's basically a one-man show. So I represent them with the FDA. I lobby for them with Congress. I get them talking to each other about best practices, uh, questions and issues they have internally about how things get done. Sometimes, and this can be in any industry, um, you're so inside a silo in your own company that if you just talk to a peer, somebody in another company that's, that's well, competitive with you, you learn a lot and you realize, oh, this is a problem that somebody else has already faced and can solve. So I do that along with all the back office functions, administrative, HR, uh, accounting, payroll, et cetera, while recruiting member companies and all of this other stuff, traveling to trade shows, booking my own travel, writing legislative submissions, uh, writing regulatory submissions to the FDA. Um, this has nothing to do with the podcast. But what I discovered from doing the podcast was a lot of the things I have to do for the job, like speaking to people I've never talked to before, getting up in front of an open comment session with 200 people in the audience and a bunch of panelists I need to convince of a point, that having this show and doing what I do with the podcast every week helps. Um, I have several times been in positions where I thought as nervous as I was, I was in front of a microphone. The panelists ahead of me were in front of microphones and I just need to make eye contact with someone and start talking and we'll, we'll be okay. Um, so it is nothing at all like what I do for the, the show, but it's, it somehow ties together for me. Uh, so that's the day gig. What inspired me to start the podcast was Mark Marin's WTF podcast, where he interviews, at the time, he was interviewing other stand-up comics and people in showbiz and getting getting really good conversations out of them in a long format, like an hour-long plus conversation. Now, Marin also does like 15 to 20-minute introductions. I try not to do anything that long. This episode's going to be an aberration, of course, but... Um, that was really the model for me. I looked at what Marin was doing. I thought, okay, I know some interesting people. I know good writers and artists. I can start this process. And I think I knew in the back of my mind that there would be a cascade effect, that once you started to get outside of, well, w once you produced a couple of good episodes, one guest would refer you to another potential guest or somebody would discover the show and contact you. And that's really held up. There's been a big well, cascade effect of guests where one person refers me and, and then it leads to a whole thread of other guests. And when I start pitching people on the show, I have a roster that I can tailor to, to whoever that particular person is. And that really helps. Um, but honestly, yeah, this all came from Mark Marin. Um, all hail the, the pod father. And I'm dying to get him on the show, which is a question that comes up later on in this episode. Now, Glennis, as I mentioned, asks, uh, how did I get into comics and literature or vice versa and pharmaceuticals, which I've already covered? Um, I also, she asked, how the two lives go along side by side. I joke that the podcast uh, zeroes out my karma for all the negative stuff I have to do as a lobbyist or the soul destroying aspect of simply being a lobbyist. Um, but I know there are good things I do through the show or through the, the, the job also. Um, they're just, they're not art, but... I helped develop a system that brings generic drugs more inexpensively to patients, and that has a much bigger effect than most of the podcasts that I've recorded, I'll be honest. Um, so while I say it zeroes out my karma, you know, it's all just part of the making sure I have something fulfilling in my life, artistically or creatively, and, and that's what the show does. I got into comics because I guess my brother got me into comics. My father used to go to ham radio flea markets called Ham Fests, and uh, 
I think my brother would travel with him. I was three years younger, or I am three years younger. And my brother would travel with my old man to these ham fests and come back with stripped comics, no covers or anything, but, you know, just stacks of, of old superhero books. And I think that was the start for me. I was born in the early 70s, and so once we started buying comics on, on newsstands and convenience stores, it was mid-70s, um, Captain America's, Howard the Duck, things like that, uh, moved into the great uh, superhero comics of that era, the Claremont and Burn X-Men, Frank Miller's Daredevil, things like that. And that was my uh, my intro. Literature, on the other hand, some of it came as suggestions from the comics. I was a science fiction kid, so I was reading lots of, of that stuff. And in fact, just this past weekend, uh, my wife and I discovered that the original BBC Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy TV show, the, the six-episode run, uh, is on Amazon Prime. So started watching that and realized I must have been 12 or so, and that was a comic book recommendation, too. It came out of an issue with the Teen Titans that Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide was probably my big, big influence at that point until I discovered Alan Moore when I was about 15 or so. Um, I, but I'd read a lot of science fiction. I'd hang out in the science fiction section at the local well, local Walden Books, um, reading Harry Harrison's Stainless Steel Rat novels, uh, Tales of the Galactic Midway by Alan Resnick, things like that. So a lot of science fiction started to seg into literature, literature. Again, starting with recommendations from comics. Alan Moore turned me on to V, uh, the comic book V for Vendetta turned me on to, to V by Thomas Pynchon. That kind of sent me on a couple of neat directions. My senior year of high school English teacher, Joe Blake, uh, the late Joe Blake, turned me on to Italio Calvino and a couple of other great authors. And uh, that's where I really started to, to flourish. But yeah, superhero comics into science fiction novels, into uh, alt comics and art comics and lit. So that's comics and literature. Now, Kyle Cassidy asks, and Kyle is a renowned photojournalist and the author of This Is What a Librarian Looks Like. What's your go-to setup for podcasting on the go? What microphones and recorders do you use and why did you pick those? Also, how much editing do you do? Do you go so far as to shorten people's responses by deleting gaps while they were thinking? Okay, at the end of every episode, I, I do produce a colophon of what I used, but I will give that to you here. I do most of my shows away from home, so it's always a remote setup. Um, the intro and outro I do at home connected to a, uh, the computer. That's got a particular setup, um, which I include in the colophon, but here's just the remote stuff. It's a pair of blue Encore 200 mics with XLR cables feeding into a Zoom 5 digital recorder. Um, I also use a Zoom 2 or Zoom H2 as a backup recorder. I bring an extension cord and USB adapter so neither recorder is running off batteries or always running off wall power because <laughs> battery life, I would go insane. Uh, the neat thing with the Blue Encore 200s is that they're dynamic microphones, but they're phantom powered. And this is just technical stuff that most of you are not going to dig, but it creates a better sound than either using non-phantom power dynamics or phantom powered condenser mics. Uh, again, uh, phantom powered dynamics are a, a weird breed and the Zoom H5 does provide phantom power. So that's my setup. Now, how did I discover this stuff? Mark Marin, once again. Uh, Mark answered me on Twitter a bunch of years ago when I asked him what he uses for his on-the-road setup, given that most of his episodes are done uh, in his garage. And he sent over basically this, uh, this setup. It was the H4 at the time, but um, the H5 turns out to be a better microphone. Now, as far as editing, or uh, H5 is a better digital recorder. As far as editing goes... I play back the entire conversation every single time. I do not speed it up. I go through, I listen to the whole shebang. Beforehand, I work on the background noise and try and remove some of that. Um, when it comes to editing the content, I do occasionally trim the long gaps, but only the really long ones. And I used to be more focused on that. And now I, I really feel in the last couple of years, the gaps... They can stay in. They, I like the natural vibe. If it's an insanely long gap, yes, I will cut 
a little bit here and there. Um, because sometimes they can be too long. But generally, I've gotten much more forgiving about that stuff because when you get down to it, this is about a person thinking, not just speaking. And sometimes the pause helps us understand a little bit more of the importance of what they're saying. Our next couple of questions are about my running habit. And we'll say habit as though it's... Um, it's something that I abuse. It's fine. I um, I took up running July of 2018, and that's sort of pretty much all the context you need here. Ian Kelly, a, let's see, former pod guest and a pal of mine from St. John's College back in the 90s, asks, how has running affected your reading? And Kate LaCour, uh, an upcoming guest and the uh, artist behind the upcoming book, Vivisectionary, says... Haruki Murakami writes about how running has impacted his writing. He goes on at length about how it's made him cultivate his discipline, focus, and self-mastery. More briefly, he talks about the meditative effect of running and how it sort of rinses the mind. So, does running affect your personal work? I'm curious broadly about how that plays out. I'm also thinking in terms of the nature of interviews and conversations that you do, which are relational, whereas both running and reading-slash-writing may have strong communities, but are basically lone wolf activities. So that's uh, Ian and Kate's questions, both around how running has impacted what I do. Um, what's interesting about her lone wolf point is that uh, most of the running I do nowadays is with a group, and that's made it better. I used to, from July of last year till about May of this year, run solo, and I ran crappy. I didn't know how to pace myself. I just would go full speed after a little warm-up and conk out after two to three miles. I'd sweat and accomplish something, but still, um, I, tended not, I tended to fade in, in any races I ran. I ran very few. Then I ran a 5K with um, in my hometown here in New Jersey and tried to keep up with this older guy, uh, turns out about 21 years older than me, and did so for the first about 2.75 miles out of the 3.1 miles of a 5K, at which point he just kept going and going, and I conked out. Um, I hooked up with him and his pal after. They're both about 20 years older than me, and they run, well, they're retired, and they, they both run three days a week plus a, uh, a Saturday long run between five miles and 11 miles on Saturdays, and um, invited me along with the rest of their running group. And I've started doing that regularly. Um, two or three times a week on weekdays, I'll do five or seven mile runs. And then on weekends, I've discovered I can run 11 miles. Uh, distance has changed what I think of about running. When I started, you know, it really changed how I saw distances and elevations. I'd start to see hills and think how I could run up those, what distances were to go there and back. Um, and it was useful. But now that I've started running with a group, um, I've understood more about pace, distance, knowing when to kick in at the end. They hate the fact that I usually still have gas on the last third of a mile on our 5.3 mile runs, and I can just take off on the final incline and, and zoom past everyone. But that, to, so to that extent, it's less of a lone wolf thing than more of a community thing. At the same time, what's great about this is that none of these people give a crap about my job or my podcast. No one asks. We talk about town council meetings, the Yankees, uh, garbage pickup, their grandkids. There's nothing about art and writers and cartoonists and the economics of this art form or anything. And I'm happy about that. It's great. I get to just be a guy going out for a run with some old, well, new old pals uh, there's a shifting group of other people who join, come and go, and, and that's it. So to that extent, it's neat that I've built a little com or I've joined a little community where I don't have to prove anything beyond how far and how fast I can run. Now, at the same time, the discipline that I've developed in terms of running, the regularity, the, you know, just the – actually, it's not the regularity. It's the seeing the improvements – seeing how much better I am now than when I started that has changed reading, writing, and other things for me. Uh, in terms of I've started doing weights and other exercises because I could see the importance of regular 
activity. It's a line I've used about the show for years. The podcast is the first thing in my life where regular activity done repetitively has led to improvement. I'm a million times better as an interviewer now than I was in 2012 when I started. Um, there are things I can do in conversations when something isn't working well that I can now, I, I could not have done back then. So this show was the proof that I could improve that stuff, but that was still a mental trait as opposed to something physical like running. I couldn't finish a half mile in July of last year uh, in my neighborhood before conking out. And a week and a half ago was 13.1 miles with the running group. And I realized that's a half marathon. And uh, you never ran more than a 5K before this, before May when you joined up with these guys. So um, it's helped in terms of letting me know that I am capable of this stuff, that the rigor and that um, discipline, focus and self-mastery that Kate refers to can translate into other aspects of what I do. Very recently, I started journal, keeping a journal every day. Um, and there are times it degenerates into just chronicling stuff that happened as opposed to getting into my mind. But again, I made the practice to do it every day. And that's important. Uh, going back to the overarching um, lesson from all of our guests, you know, keep doing the work. So I don't think the podcast is affected by running per se. And I don't know if reading necessarily is, except for helping me, um, well, to force more limits and maximize my use of time. Because I now know I'm going to leave the house at 10 past 7, run with the guys at 7.30, get back 8.45 in the morning. That would have been time that I could have spent reading, although we all know we'd spend that time goofing around on the Internet instead. So it's helped me with that, with knowing that, okay, 6 o'clock to 7 a.m., I've got to spend reading so that I can leave and, and go do this stuff with the guys. Um, so, yeah, it's less about that, more about the overall, this is what discipline and, and you know, regular function, regular activity can do. Now, Dean Haspiel, who is the uh, who has a new collection coming, The Red Hook, Volume 2, War Cry. Uh, it's coming in October from Image Comics. You should pre-order because that, that does help. Uh, Dino asks, <laughs> and this is good, why do you show how much you've sweat most every time you go for a run? Is it an easy way for you to mark a goal, hold yourself accountable in public? I have to admit, it makes me a little queasy to see that much wet salt and what are probably copious amounts of emotional toxins banished into a shirt and shorts. For a guy like me who is known for his soul-bearing proclivities, I'm not trying to shame you at all. I'm just wondering. That's okay, Dino. Uh, I'm much more about shaming everybody else. That was my initial impulse for doing this. I would post pictures on Instagram of my sweat-drenched shirts with the hashtag sweat like Patrick Ewing, uh, because that is, in fact, how much I sweat. Uh, I also use the hashtag positive inertia, which was the idea that once I get moving and get running, you're going to keep running. Um, I don't post those so much anymore. Um, now that I've gotten into a, a regular rhythm with the old guys, I tend to post like distance and time maps from the app uh, we all use called Strava. But a few sweat pics do roll in. And in fact, this weekend I ran nine miles in a pair of sort of bright blue shorts and it was so humid and stanky um basically when we finished up it looked like i had been completely incontinent uh in in the short so i had to take a picture of that and post it um but yeah it was a sense of posting those to show that i'm out there busting my ass and maybe other people should be out there busting their ass too i know not everybody has the same situation as me and the same liberty or freedoms that i do for certain times a day but I was showing that a 48-year-old guy can still get off his ass and run in single-degree temperatures and get back in sweating or with ice covering his beard or whatever. Um, there was a, you know, a sense of accomplishment, I guess, behind it and a, a, a desire to chronicle it. Again, I've dropped off from posting those because now it's all about um, just posting maps of the the Strava finales or the 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 routes that we run and the times and they're not fast times but the distances are pretty significant eddie portnoy the uh, author of bad rabbis writes i want to know what was the funniest bleeding nipple comment you received to which i want to tell eddie there's absolutely nothing funny about my bleeding from my tits okay um the thing i didn't know when i started running um is that once you start doing long distances you'll chafe <laughs> 
And one of these 11 mile runs, I chafed both of my bro uh, my boobs pretty badly. And around the 10 mile mark, looked down and saw, huh, my left boob is red and bleeding and didn't notice the right one, or maybe it hadn't started yet. So we did the final mile back to the uh, the starting point and discovered, yeah, no, I'm, I'm bleeding from both my tits. So, of course, I took a picture of that and posted it because why wouldn't you? So that's the extent of the running questions. If anyone has more uh, running stuff they want to know about, uh, because I'm sure I've scared everybody off of doing that in future, fire away. Uh, Kate Mariyama, author of Harrowgate, writes... Tell me where your love of racing dogs started, how those rescues went, and where they led. Um, I own a greyhound, uh, Bendico, who's named after the hunting dog from uh, Giuseppe Lampedusa's novel, The Leopard, which is one of my all-time faves. Um, and we had two greyhounds previously, uh, Rufus T. Firefly Roth and Otis B. Driftwood Roth, both named after Groucho Marx characters. Um, the greyhound thing was Amy's idea. Uh, my wife. She wanted a dog. I was tentative because I do travel a lot for work. I think at the time, she, yeah, at the time she still had a job in the city, so she was gone during the days. I didn't think it was fair and other excuses for not making a commitment. And then one time I was in the city waiting for her and I saw some hipster just walking by with his dog. And it just hit me. If that dude can manage owning a dog, so can we. So my wife, who is more socially conscious than I am, started researching, figured out from rescue dogs that greyhounds would be sort of perfect for us. And uh, and we adopted Rufus T. Firefly Roth. Um, greyhounds are wonderful dogs. They do not need to run around like maniacs. They got all the running out when they were on the track, generally. Um, all three that we have owned were couch potatoes. They could sleep 18 hours a day. Uh, Bendico in particular, our new one, because he's a black dog, does not like being outside during summer because he conducts a lot of heat. So he just goes out for short walks, comes back in. He's he's just fine. Um, but they were they were good adoptions. The second one, Otis B. Driftwood, we were going to adopt this female dog at the Greyhound uh, Friends of New Jersey Adoption Fair went down to the the fair and discovered that this female dog was absolutely nuts and had attacked another dog during the drive over to the the fair. And so we saw this other one, a brindle, and um he was fine. He walked over, put his head right on or his chin right on our other dog's back. The other dog just looked at us a little perplexed, but he was fine with it. We thought it was cute, not realizing it was a dominance thing. And um adopted Otis and the two of them got along just fine. They were wonderful and um, here's the thing about owning a dog. Now, I when I used to work in an office up until 2014, um, sometimes I would get really stressed and I'd get burned out and I'd be pissed off on the 20 to 25 minute drive home. And I would have all of these angry conversations going on in my head and all this stuff I couldn't say to someone, but I was really angry about and I would open the front door and Rue and Otis would be waiting at the top of the stairs, wagging away like maniacs. And my heart would lighten up. I would just lose everything I was I was uptight about because these guys I know you could say it's not love, whatever. These guys love me and they were happy to see me and happy to go outside and, and go for a nice walk. Even middle of winter, we'd, I'd put their coats on and we'd go, greyhounds don't have any body fat, so you need to, to put coats on them. And we'd just go out for a nice walk. And um, they were my salvation. And Benny also serves that purpose. I work at home now, but he still will just come downstairs while I'm working and basically curl up down by my feet or go over to the sofa here in the, the library and just curl up and then flip over and wait for me to come over and scratch his belly and... And that would be that. So that is how my um, my love of racing dogs started, how the rescues went, and where they led. Thanks, Kate. Now, Tom Spurgeon, who is the um, the lead man at the comics reporter dot com, uh, runs Cartoon Crossroads Columbus Festival, and is the primary author of "We Told You So: Comics as Art: The Oral History of Fantagraphics Publishing." He writes, "Take a step back for me and." Talk about the entirety of the podcast. You have a pretty distinct comics track and a pretty distinct prose publishing track. Or at least you can break your guest list down that way. 
What's changed in those two areas the most, the way they contrast against each other? What's different about those two groups of artists then and now? That's a good one, and I haven't written any notes for this, so I'm not sure where this response is going to go. Um, first thing, a lot of people, not a lot of people, some people consider this a comics podcast. I was running the numbers um, last weekend and noticed or counted it out, and in any year, it has never been more than 40% of a year's guests who are comics makers or like directly part of the comics world. Maybe that is high anyway, even 40%, but but seriously, it's only at best 20 out of 50 guests who are actually in comics. It just seems, I guess, more more than it is. Um, how have comics changed, comics guests and prose guests changed from then to now? Um, I get a higher class of prose guests in some respects, although that's, that's hit or miss. Um, but there are publishing people who send me, you know, bigger name authors or try and reach out more. Um, with comics people... I don't know. I um, I mean, it's been seven years, so cartoonists who I dug back in the 80s and 90s are seven years older. And as such, you know, there's a, a much younger cohort that's building and building. I, and it's a question that comes up later, still have a difficulty in terms of relating to much younger artists and, and the art that they make. It's very different than the sort of comics or the sort of writing that I like. Um. When it comes to how they contrast against each other, these the, the writer or the cartoonists and the prose people, um, I don't know. This is one I'm going to have to get back to because I just don't know how the groups have changed vis-a-vis -vis how I get different types of guests. Like certain guests, like a, a Milton Glaser, I would not have gotten when I was just starting out, but we recorded a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if that means the type of guest has changed or if it signifies something about the non-comics people. But anyway, let's go on to the next one. Jonathan Hyman, a photographer and creator of The Landscapes of 9-11, A Photographer's Journey, writes, Though I do not object and, in fact, find your approach and sensibility enlightening, why the emphasis on those who make comics and graphic novels? Is it a stay close to home sort of thing? Now, Every so often I get asked, what's your your guest thing? Who do you interview? And I tell people, interesting creative people who actually say yes when I invite them to do the show. And in that respect, yes, comics people may be a little overrepresented. Um, part of it is also that there are festivals. I go to about four festivals a year that tie into getting me shows for, for comics. Uh, TCAF, MOCA. TCAF is Toronto, MOCA is New York City, uh, SPX down in Maryland, uh, Small Press Expo, and Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, Tom's show in, in Columbus, Ohio. And there you're going to get a concentration of guests. I can set up in a hotel room and have guests come in to, to sit down and record. So um, it, it's practically more doable. Simultaneously, or similarly, um, their work does not require as much in-depth reading as an author who has 10 novels or a couple of different nonfiction books. With cartoonists, I, a lot of them I already have the background for. I can launch right into a conversation. So again, like I say, cartoonists never make up more than 40% of a, a year's guests. But um, I've loved comics since I was a kid. I grew up into arts comics or indie comics or alt or whatever you want to call them, the non-superhero genre. And um, that stuff I find, I find more interesting things going on within comics than I do in prose fiction, at least. With nonfiction, it's different, depends on the, the subject matter. But, um, but that's part of why I pursue comics. It's a, a form that I love, and I found that cartoonists really appreciate the sort of approach I bring and the type of, of conversation we can have. Now, David Leopold, who is the, uh, the curator of the Ben Soloway studio and editor of the Hirschfeld Century, Portrait of an Artist and His Age, asks, have you ever started an interview and realized that it was not going to work for a show? What did you do? Well, I can make almost any scenario work. Uh, only a few conversations that I've recorded have not actually run. And sometimes that is at the guest's request because they were not happy with how it went. 
Uh, I figure almost anything is salvageable. Um, there was one very recently that I thought went fine. Guest told me the next day, don't run it. Wouldn't reply when I asked why. It'll never air. We'll never know why. Well, deal. There was one, though. Um, I had a Reggie Jackson day in Cambridge uh, in the UK back in 2015, where I recorded with Clive James, his wife, Prue Shaw, and the great translator Anthea Bell. And I always tell people that was my Reggie Jackson, three home runs back to back to back. The thing was, there was a fourth one that day, and it didn't work at all. And the guest didn't really, I mean, he knew what I did, but didn't get that this was going to be a conversation for a podcast. I guess he thought we were just going to do a couple of quick questions, and the vibe didn't work. And, you know, it was like pulling teeth somewhat. He's a very reserved English guy, just didn't go. And the best thing was that when I got home... There was a problem with the audio file. It was all static laden, probably from the power in the, the little uh, hotel I was staying in in Cambridge. So I just thought, you know, just going to put that one aside. I'll email the guy and say it just it didn't work and we'll maybe someday down the line go on from there. So it's rare, but it happens sometimes. But, uh, you know, often it's just that a guest has short answers to things and is kind of, of – brusque or doesn't get that it's going to be a more open-ended conversation and i have to do some work to bring that out but um outside of just a couple of occasions it has always worked out eddie portnoy the bad rabbis guy uh, had a second question and that was who was your most obstreperous guest and why to which i have an answer barry blitt the great illustrator for the new yorker the guy who does all these great trump covers uh, I drove up to his place. We shot the breeze for like an hour. Great conversation before putting the mics out. Uh, I put the mics out and he clammed up and turned this into like cringe comedy shtick. Just not 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 in a shticky way, but just made it so difficult that I just had to keep fighting and pulling to get something out. His his peers have told me it's a wonderful interview. They They got a lot out of it and it was entertaining watching him do that and watching me keep pushing um and afterwards we had lunch and great conversation but for some reason mics were out there and it just he just made it difficult he was my most obstreperous guest when it comes to why you'll have to ask him and we've met subsequently and, and had nice friendly conversation although i'm sure after this <laughs> possibly not but that is your answer barry blitt was my most obstreperous guest Payne Prophet, a UK-based artist and painter, and a, I'm very thankful, Patreon supporter of the podcast, writes, I just wanted to ask what specific graphic novels over the years have made an emotional impact on you and left their mark. Whether they hit like a punch or have subtly touched you, which ones have had an emotional effect on you that have stuck over the years or changed your course at the time? And what made them so important or personal? Um, there are, well... I've written a long blog post about this years ago. The graphic novel Hicksville by Dylan Horrocks was so important to me that I actually flew from New Jersey to New Zealand. Um, not that I was going to discover Hicksville, but it was it was such a moving work, and it just made me so long for for the end, of, the bottom of the world, or, the, or another side of the planet where things could be different. But I actually took like a two-week tour down in New Zealand. I got to meet with Dylan my first day there and um, thank him for, for everything that, that that book had provided for me. Um, I don't think he thought I would actually follow up when he signed the book or inscribed the book for me back in the, the 90s and said, you'll always have a friend in Hicksville. Um, but I did, lo and behold, a few years later, hit him up and say, hey, Dylan, I'm, I'm coming into Auckland and could use a place to stay overnight. Um, so that book, that book meant the world to me, uh, and still does. It's an amazing, amazing comic. It is about a little town in New Zealand where everyone makes comics and they're all different genres that they work in. Um, if you haven't read it yet, Hicksville, you should, I have a, a page of art from it on my, my walls here in the library. Uh, Graffiti Kitchen by Eddie Campbell, which is a, a complex story about his relationships, autobiographical strip uh, that he also did in the early 90s. Um, I don't think I can go 
into specifically what was so important, but it was at an age where I was just coming into my 20s, starting to see how complex relationships could really get. And um, and Eddie, seeing what he went through and how he how his autobiographical doppelganger stood in for it all, um, that was that was important to me. And it showed me what comics could do, that it could address. There was a, a, a panel that he drew once a million years ago of him and Alan Moore, Eddie and Alan Moore arm wrestling and Alan Moore is saying Thomas Pynchon and Eddie is saying Henry Miller. And um, it really did bring this, this in a good sense, this Henry Miller approach to comics and relationships that I really dug. Um, so much of Jaime and Beto Hernandez's Love and Rockets comics have, have just pummeled me over the years and, and have, have been incredibly important to me as a reader. But I have to say the thing that affected me the most was only a few years ago, a comic that Jaime did called The Love Bunglers. At the time, it didn't have that title. It was collected as The Love Bunglers. It came out in serial form. Um, it is all about Maggie, his his ongoing character who he created back in the early 80s, and her boyfriend, Ray. And if I start to describe the really important part of it, I will start crying the way um, Jaime told me he cried when he actually drew it. But it's basically a two-page spread of how these two characters have seen each other their entire lives. And it's amazing how much life he can bring to, to totally fictional characters and how much he invests in them. And something I talked about with a couple of his peers about his, if we'll say the key to talking to Jaime is to talk about the characters as though they're people, not as though they're stand-ins for him or avatars of this, that, or the other. That he believes and he brings those characters to life. That's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So that's uh, that's a lot, Bunglers. That's the first instance of Gil getting emotional in this podcast. And I pray to God there won't be too many of those. Nobody needs any of that. Recently, and this is a weird one, Black Dog by Dave McKean. It is a book about the artist Paul Nash. And it's about war and trauma and what goes into making art and I'd had the book on my shelf for quite a while and, and brought it with me on a trip to Germany and then the UK because I was going to interview Dave and read it in the airport and figured I'd read it a few times in the five days I had before we got together. And simply that first time just just annihilated my soul. It's one of the most amazing and beautiful books. And I thought I might be too old to get that walloped by by a comic, by a graphic novel. But no, no, something that's that artfully made in terms of the story, the the graphics and everything Dave brings to his work. Um it was it was just breathtaking and it continues to haunt me. I mentioned that to him. We were corresponding very recently, which is uh me self aggrandizing because it's fucking awesome that I get to correspond with Dave McKean sometimes. And sometimes he reaches out to me, which <laughs> blows my mind. Um and I mentioned to him, I uh, continue to be haunted by Black Dog. I know you're working on other stuff, but, you know, pace yourself because uh, I can only take so much, you know, emotional walloping. So Hicksville, Graffiti Kitchen, Love Bunglers, Black Dog. There are a million others. I'm looking at a, a whole shelf of graphic novels here in my library, and I could probably rattle off a whole bunch more. I'm going to be mad at myself for not mentioning certain ones, but just start with those. Pain, those are the ones that uh, that have stuck with me, that jumped out at me. Now, David Townsend, a tutor at St. John's College, and one of my very first guests forwarded a question from Kate Moradian, a cartoonist for the Armenian Weekly. She writes, as a relatively new medium, the concept of the graphic novel is still forming and evolving. What do you envision will distinguish the graphic novel? And I assume she means in relation to print or prose. Um, I, As I mentioned earlier, I think there's more innovation, more inventiveness in storytelling in comics than there is in prose. And maybe that's a bias on my part. You could probably find 50 examples that'll counter that. But I think there's more being done. And it's not just in terms of like Chris Ware formal um, exercises or, or ways of experimenting with understanding of time, but there's so many different things that work within comics that are not film or TV, that are not prose but are unique to that form that I think 
you know, and this is getting on the Scott McCloud uh, uh, cloud, basically, you know, the form's almost limitless in terms of what it can do. And so I'm really excited. I'm glad that I have gotten to read younger cartoonists largely as part of the podcast, because otherwise I would never come across a lot of these things. The podcast led to me being um, asked to be a guest judge for the Slate CCS Center for Cartoon Studies uh, Studio Prize, and I got to discover a lot of uh, younger cartoonists work that way. Um, there's there's always neat stuff going on. There's amazing work out there. There is nothing in any art form, I believe, that mirrors what Jim Woodring does with his Frank comics. And he's another person who, I don't want to say believes, but, you know, treats what's going on in his comics as something he's representing, that he's, he's almost filtering another reality into to this one. Um, yeah, it, it's, I think comics have so much room to, to grow. And that I think in that respect, they're not just going to be IP factories for Netflix TV shows. They're not going to be adaptations of, of prose. They can seriously do things that are, are so far different than every other form out there. So, Kat, David, I am looking forward to seeing where comics go in future. My brother, Boaz Roth, writes, Reading Emily Nussbaum's recent amazing review in The New Yorker, I felt as if I more or less read this before. And that's not a slight against her. Her writing is great. Her observations are always thought-provoking. But here's a question. In the end, even in this golden age of peak TV, are we just watching the same show over and over, especially since binge is now the, the mode of viewing? This is something I'm, I'm interested in. I had a good conversation with Emily about her book of profiles and reviews um, I like to watch, uh, was the, the title, uh, just a few weeks ago. And it was disturbing to me how easy it was for us to fall into talking about individual shows. You know, what did you think of the ending of The Americans? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? Um, it is our common parlance. At the same time, there's a limit to how much any of us can watch. And it's something I asked her, what did you accept that you could not keep up with everything? Um, and that, that question that Boaz has about watching the same show over and over this is uh, something that happened after recording an upcoming episode. I was I was recording with Simon Doonan um, last week, and we were walking around the block afterwards to to get to the subway, and we talked about his uh, the reality show that he's on, uh, the contest show, making it, which I enjoyed the living hell out of. Uh, it's him as a judge with the hosts Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman. I'm afraid I'm blanking on the name of the other judge. I apologize, um, but. I knew it existed. I'd seen it in passing on Twitter. I bumped into Simon Doonan last year on the streets uh, of the West Village, and he mentioned making it, um, had just debuted the week before. And I thought, oh, my God, yeah, okay, we've got to go DVR that. And, and my wife and I actually watched it on the, the NBC app instead, so that way they would register the number of views uh, of, of you know people watching it. And the show was a, a hit by today's standards. Over a million viewers got renewed for a second season, which is coming in November, Simon tells us. But when we were walking, we talked about how when, well, when we were younger, the numbers were so much greater for everything. Like Walter Cronkite would reach 50 million people a night. And now, you know, a million viewers is a really good audience for a, a show like Making It. And he said, you know, I remember watching I, Claudius on PBS when it first came out. I don't remember what I watched last night. And yet I said to him, everything, I bet you watched the greatest thing ever last night because everything is the greatest thing ever. There's so much media push and investment in making every new prestige show the greatest show there is. I think my brother's right. There, there's a sense that I don't, I don't necessarily think the shows are similar, although there might be some of that. But I think the way we consume we're just consuming. We're barely, barely judging anything anymore. And I try not to binge. Like watching one episode a night of something for several weeks is my idea of binging. I don't like watching, well, I generally don't watch four or five episodes of something at a time. That said, Amy and I, uh, a year or so ago, went through all 220 something episodes of Frasier uh, because I'd never seen it before. And when you start watching it, you can do two or three episodes in an hour and you're, you're fine. Um, which is a lot different than these hour plus shows that 
just eat up a, a chunk of the evening. Um, we tend to have the TV on for maybe two, two and a half hours a night. So there isn't the watching 10 episodes at a time. We started Glow last night, the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling new season. We watch one episode. We'll watch another one tonight, maybe two, but we're not going to plow through four or five at a time. Um, but for most people, yeah, it's all about binging and watching it and being able to to keep up with a conversation with everybody else who's already binged it. And I think that is damaging. So I think my brother's right. Um, but I think it's tied into the mode of consumption more than the um, the nature of the shows themselves and maybe the, the media focus on making everything in demand as much as you can. Now, uh, Chris Reynolds is next. Chris is a, well, the cartoonist who had his work most recently co collected by New York Review Comics as The New World Comics from Mauritania, which are exceedingly strange, surreal, and, and wonderful. Uh, Chris writes, I've been carrying on with Comics as Radio, influenced by the KCRW Organist podcast. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. And he says, my friend Alan Jackson did a performance of my comics as radio story, Sexton Blake in the 64th floor at the Train of Thought Gallery in Worthing. And we discussed it with John Park, whose idea it was. And that's a another YouTube link that I'll post. So my question, he writes, is what do you think of comics as radio? And he adds, I hope you're still getting lots of fun from doing the podcast. No. Um Second part first, I am still getting lots of fun from doing the podcast. I admit I was down a little bit um, earlier this summer, but this is still the thing I enjoy doing the most. Comics as radio, I have never tried. Um, I'm going to now give them a shot because Chris has brought it up. It does make me wonder, in, in tune with what I was saying about David Townsend and, and Kat Moradian, about comics as a unique thing. Um, when it's radio, does it become radio drama and as such is it just story being funneled in terms of dialogue and sound effects in a way that comics ultimately center around the panel well this is the the scott mcleod thing again the panel and what comes between the panels how do we understand time what are we doing when we're reading from panel to panel to panel so um my knee-jerk reaction is i comics as radio may not be comics but i don't know because i haven't tried them so i'm going to do that Laniers, the great Argentine cartoonist uh, and genius behind the comic strip Macanudo, writes, What are your favorite, if any, Latin American comics? I assume this is because he wanted me to say Laniers, Macanudo. It really is an absolutely wonderful comic strip. So that is one of my, my favorite Latin American comics since it's coming out of Argentina or Vermont where Laniers currently lives. I was very embarrassed because I started looking over my shelves and trying to figure out what was Latin American? And um, there is not a lot. There is, however, Munoz and Sampaio's Alex Sinner comics, as well as their Billy Holiday bio uh, uh, biography. Uh, so Munoz and Sampaio, who are also Argentinian, although they moved to, to Europe, they are among my favorite Latin American comics. Oscar Zarate, I've only read The Park, as well as his one Shakespeare adaptation that I'm blanking on. I think it was Macbeth. And he did the illustration or the, the drawing for Alan Moore's comic, The Small, uh, A Small Killing. Um, so we'll take uh, Oscar Zarate also as a, a, a favorite Latin American cartoonist. Sergio Aragones, um, born in Spain, lived in Mexico. Is Mexico Latin America? If it is, then Sergio is at my absolute number one because he's the greatest cartoonist ever. If you start considering Mexican-American, then the Hernandez brothers come in. But at that point, is it Latin American or is it American? Um, so loaded question, Laniers. Thanks for, for posting it. I'm going to say you are, you know, number two behind Sergio and Munoz and Sampaio are 2A, I guess. Now, Caleb Crane, who is next week's guest, has a wonderful new novel coming out next week called Overthrow. Uh, three questions. Uh, what's the most surprising answer you ever got from a guest? What got you started interviewing people? I already addressed that one. And what do you think a podcast can do that a written profile can't? The most surprising answer, I'm sure there were individual moments where someone said something that, that floored me. But the whole point of doing the show for me is to be surprised. Like, 
I do re- when I'm I'm researching some of these guests, I try and look up recent interviews of theirs, and I try not to ask the same questions. I, I occasionally will leave a softball there because I know, especially for guests who don't know me or aren't, aren't part of this world, they need to sort of have that reassurance that this is still a media friendly thing. They're going to get to to talk about their book and what went into it. But as you long term listeners know, you know I like to go pretty far afield from just the book itself. So. My whole thing is that I want to be surprised. I don't want to ask the things that I know they're going to, to uh, that I already know how they're going to going to feed back to me. I, I want to find something that I had no idea was coming, and that's well, that's what I do. You, you now understand what my technique is: the the need to be surprised. Uh, but again, I'm sure the moment I finish this one, I'm going to think, you know, it was the time that blah 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 said X that I was completely floored. Um, and there have been, I'm sure, plenty of moments like that. So what do I think a podcast can do that a written profile can't? Um, I'm going to say you, the thing I most hate about written profiles nowadays is that they are almost always about what the, uh, the celebrity guest ordered for food or drink where that person and the, the writer got together to meet. Um, we don't get into that, although my past guest, Scott Edelman, has launched Eating the Fantastic, a podcast similar to this one, but always at restaurants where he and the guest are eating and that's part of the whole shebang that works for him doesn't work for me because uh, frankly uh, no one should ever have to hear or watch me eat so what can a podcast do it can provide voice tone a flow of conversation those pauses that i mentioned with kyle cassidy's question those aren't captured in a profile you can get what the the guest is thinking you can guess you can get how quickly they respond to something or how much something matters to them. You can get a sense of their passion um, from from the 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 voice from from the way a podcast flows also maybe I like this more than writing because it's also more of how my mind works and how I make conversation, how I respond to what they say. I know that in some of these things, I'll just suddenly interject with a question that I've got written down, but other times it becomes that interaction between us. Once they say something that I didn't know was coming and we could start growing from there. So I like the podcast form, the conversation form, because it it's how my mind interacts with another person's mind and what we, what we learn to say, what we learn to see when we're just looking at each other across a table. Um, a, po- a written profile can approximate some of that, but it doesn't capture it in the moment the way the way this show does, the way the, the very nature of doing a show like this does. Now, Bob Eckstein, who is the author of The Illustrated History of the Snowman, Footnotes from the World's Greatest Bookstores, and most recently, The Ultimate Cartoon Book of Book Cartoons, he couldn't think of anything, so he just said, What would you ask President Trump? To which, so I don't get in trouble because of my day job, can you just sign whatever legislation I'm currently working on? That's it. I'm not putting anything else out there. Ursi Soteropoulos, author of What's Left of the Night, this amazing novel about Kavafi, uh, C.P. Kavafi, the, the Alexandrian poet, which was published in translation in the U.S. by New Vessel Press, who you should definitely check out, she writes... During our interview, I've been happily, or I was happily surprised by your unconventional approach to my novel and to my writing, and by your genuine curiosity. All that somehow reminded me of Umberto Eco's opera Aperta. I don't know what that is, and I haven't had time to research it. So my question, Gil, is: Are you a writer yourself? And if not, have you ever had the temptation? I'm sure you have a lot of material from the writer's zoo. There were questions I was dreading leading up to this, primarily that kickoff one. What's the overarching lesson that you learned? This is the other question that I was really, really dreading. Am I a writer? Um, I wrote back to Ursi. You can decide for yourself and sent her two short stories that I finished back in 2013 and 14. I would say I'm not a writer because I don't write. The podcast is writing in some respects. I do write up the questions. I do create at least a framework for where a conversation could go, which I guess is sort of like writing drama. Um, the thing that I should point out about that is um, there are many respects in which uh, creating the podcast is my way of controlling a conversation. I mean, it's also a way of initiating. It means I'm getting out there, talking to people, meeting people, etc. cetera. 
uh, but also being the guy who asks the questions, although I always tell people it's a conversation, you can ask anything back that you want, um, is is staging, is, you know, I can have a conversation with people, but only if I do the research in advance and try and get a good level of, of you know, preparedness for it, which I admit borders on maybe a little bit of a neurological issue on my part. Um, I've joked that there are times I feel like I would fail a Turing test if, if put to it, but that the conversation for the podcast, I really get to keep things under control or put things together in a way that, that you know, at least there's a frame in place um, and I can control it. Maybe I'm, I'm being too self-deprecating with that, but writing up the questions, thinking about where the conversation could go, thinking about what the opening question is going to be, um, and then writing my intro and everything when I get, get home, um, or when I'm getting the episode together, those are as much writing as I do besides this journal stuff. I should write more and that's going to come in with a question later on. Um, I am thinking of a couple of personal essays, but, um, one of my past guests, Philip Lopate, uh, the king of the personal essay, or in fact, one of the greatest practitioners of that form ever to have lived. I was reading his big intro to, to the anthology of the personal essay and realized that a lot of the motivations I had for writing the essay I was writing were petty. And so I'm, I unfortunately overthinking it now to keep from actually writing it and learning what the non petty directions could be. So I know that in the process of writing it, I would learn a lot more about myself and about the subject I'm trying to tackle. But um, but I will find an excuse any way I can not to actually commit something to, to, to paper, I guess. So am I a writer? I don't write, but I should. Andrea Sarumi is the next guest. By the way, we'll see what Ursi says when she actually reads those two PDFs that I sent her. Uh, Andrea's first picture book, Accident, is coming out in a new board lap book format this month from uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Her first question is, what book or movie coming out in the next three months are you most excited about and why? And I don't have a ton. I'm not a... I've got to go see this movie, frankly, because I don't go out to the movies. I hate being around people looking at their phones. Um, I hate people's phones going off in the middle of a movie. The only good experience we had, uh, Amy and I went to the one night premiere of The Man Who Killed Don Quixote by Terry Gilliam. And I figured everybody who was going to be there, who went out of their way to go to this, would not be the type to sit around on their phones all movie long. And that, that held up. So I was happy with that experience. But otherwise, it's been years since I've gone to a movie theater. So, um, no movie coming out in the next three months who I have any excitement about. As far as books, um, there have been a couple of things that I've already received and have read that are coming out soon. Um, what I haven't read but I have received is Chris Ware's new book, Rusty Brown, which I'm really looking forward to because we're going to get together in a couple of weeks to record. Uh, Kevin Heisinga's new one, uh, the name of which I'm blanking on, I'm also looking forward to. Those are both comics, not prose. Um, Liz Hand's book, Curious Toys. We recorded a podcast in July. That's coming out in October, and it is so, so good. Um, that's one that I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how other people take that one in. Andrea's second question was, when you were growing up, what piece of art slash pop culture were you forbidden from seeing or reading? My parents are pretty permissive, um, to the point of absolute laxitude. They really did not pay attention to what we were doing. Didn't matter. My brother and I came out fine. That said, I was in my school library trying to find a copy of Dante's Inferno. <laughs> I was nine years old. Uh, nine or ten, because there was an X-Men comic, X-Men Annual Number 4, I think, uh, that was based on the Inferno. And so I wanted to read this thing. I did end up, uh, and they told me I was too young, uh, can't read it, they don't have it, um, you should not be reading something like this. I ended up finding a copy at my friend Kara Schwartzman's house and borrowed that. It was an abridged poetry, uh, uh, poetic translation, I think by Dorothy Sayers. Um, didn't get it then. Finally read The Inferno a few years ago, and uh, along with Paradiso and, and Purgatorio, not in that order. Um, but yeah, I think that was the only thing I couldn't, uh, I was quote unquote forbidden from seeing or reading. Um, now, to give you a, a bonus piece here to tell you about the thing that scared me shitless when I was a kid uh, was the uh, the commercial for the Anthony Perkins ventriloquist horror movie, Magic, uh, terrified the living hell out of me. I would cry when it came on TV. So I must have been like six, 
maybe seven, um, just just freaked me the fuck out. So um, Andrea did not ask that, but that's a thing I forbade myself from seeing or reading. So that's something. Henry Wessels, the um, antiquarian book dealer and the writer of A Conversation Larger Than the Universe, Readings in Science Fiction and the Fantastic, 1762 to 2017, asks, What books do you find yourself rereading? Why? When? With any particular aim or purpose? So... That is a good question. Uh, some of you know I keep a list of every single book I have finished since 1989 on my website. That's the uh, the year that I started college. That is 30 years of reading. I'm embarrassed about some of the books that were there at the beginning, but whatever. Um, rereading. I, I do mark when a book is a reread versus a, a first time. Very recently, uh, straddling 2018 and 19, I reread Anthony Pohl's A Dance to the Music of Time. It's 12 novels. They add up to about 3,000 pages. Um, I read it about seven or seven years before, uh, one book a month uh, throughout the entire calendar year. That was great. And for the person I was back then, I would not have been able to plow through it the way I did this time. Um, this time I was aided by knowing the shape of it all, knowing how some of the characters end up. But I just reread the entire shebang, plowed all the way through it, and, and loved it. That was partly because I was ahead on the podcast, and it was just a whim. And I thought, you know, what if I just start again? How would the book be if I, or the, the whole series be if I just go open endedly right at it? Um, and that's why I pursued that one. Uh, Chess Story by Stefan Zweig, I will pick up every so often. It's on my Kindle. Um, I'll reread that for. I don't even know why, what it brings me. I mean, there's a joy early on where the narrator is describing chess and what it means. But um, it's just got a whole, a whole psychodrama to it that I just find so absolutely compelling uh, and, and so many layers in such a short, maybe 60 or 70 page novella. Um, I guess the economy of it on top of everything just really, really compels me. So I, I return to that one periodically. Um, the Peregrine uh, nature book by J.A. Baker, which is going to come up in a few minutes. Um, that I just, I keep that on my nightstand. I'll just go into it on individual pages rather than reading through it linearly now and just, just wait until I come across some absolutely gorgeous turn of phrase. Um, weirdly, Solaris by Stanislaw Lem, which I just restarted last night. I return to that one every couple of years on my Kindle. I'll just be lying in bed in between books and just start that one again and read. And that I, I don't know what, I mean, it's, it's sort of Moby Dick in a science fiction era. And it's about the ineffability of human relationships and communication and lack of communication. Um, it's weirdly beautiful, and I, I I like just getting lost in that, knowing that there's not going to be an answer, um, and just seeing how how these minds of these characters start stretching under a strange set of circumstances, and what we can and can't ever say to each other, and how we can't recognize something, how we can't recognize God, basically, um, what is ineffable and what's what's beyond our understanding. The big one for me, the book I return to periodically, and usually right around the end of the year, Christmas time when I'd be visiting my in-laws, is Every Man by Philip Roth. It is a book about an old Jew who dies. Um, he dies at the beginning of the novel, and then we recount his, his life starting in his, his father's jewelry store in Newark. And um, and the, the marriage he destroyed, and the other marriage, and the the affairs, and all of the attempts at dealing with becoming an old man and having declining health and everything else. And, and I'd read it almost in a single day. Now it's one of his late novellas. He only, he did four books, the nemesis quartet near the end of his writing career. And, um, every man I, I adore the most maybe because it helps prepare me for death. I don't know. I didn't reread it last year. Funnily enough as the year Roth died. And for some reason, I decided not to, um, not to sit down. But the reason I, I reread is, I guess, to remeasure myself. Um, sometimes it's over over long spans. The Iliad I've read four times now, but 
it's been seven or eight years, I think, since the last one. And it really took Gil at 40-ish to read the Iliad and finally get Achilles, who I always was somewhat dismissive of or felt was a, a dick. Um, and it was only this past reading about eight or nine years ago that I, I felt him and felt what he was giving up to become the hero of the Iliad, uh, the family he gave up, the knowledge that he had as, as part, being partly divine, that he would never see them again if he took took on the role of, of Achilles. If he took on being the, the great hero of the Iliad, he knows he can never go back, but also knows that he could give it up and lead a quiet life and not be remembered. Um, so Achilles meant more to me. The Iliad has grown and stretched weirdly. And I know this is terrible because everybody loves the Odyssey. The Odyssey, for some reason, works less and less for me as I get older. Similarly, The Great Gatsby is like this. For some reason, as I get older, it has less and less hold. Um, with the Odyssey, I developed the theory that all of the fantastical stories, because they're all being told by Odysseus to someone else, may all be made up by him to cover up for the fact that he killed his entire crew and lost everything. Um, neither here nor there, but you know that that is sort of what happens when you keep rereading some of these things and start to, to posit what's really going on underneath. Anyway, um, the Odyssey is wonderful, but just doesn't work for me the way the Iliad does. I think it's because the Iliad is more about sacrifice, and I'm much more about suffering than I am about um, joy, which is ironic because my name in Hebrew means joy. <sighs> That's, I guess, too much information, but we've already talked about my tits bleeding from running, so I may as well just keep going. Vanessa Sinclair is up next. Uh, Vanessa, uh, she and her husband, Carl Abrahamson, uh, or Abramson, they make films, collages, and other art. Uh, you can find that stuff at patreon.com slash Vanessa23Carl. Um, she also does work with Caitlin Foisey, the artist I interviewed in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she asked, what are you currently reading? What are your favorite books of the summer, films of the summer, and where have you traveled recently? Travel. Um, that is boring. Uh, the last business travel I've had has been like Philadelphia and Chicago, plus visits to the FDA in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, haven't even ha haven't even had any congressional visits for a while. Um, I will have Frankfurt this fall. I had thought about going to the UK either before or after the Frankfurt trip and getting some podcasts in, and then realized that was going to be the week after the hard deadline for Brexit. So. I'm not going to the UK. I did just offer somebody today uh, that I could go to Berlin right after Frankfurt for a day or so to do some research for them. We'll see if that leads to anything. Um, the guest I'm hoping to get if I ever go to Berlin is Joe Jackson, the musician behind, well, Stepping Out was his biggest single. He lives there. Uh, if I could get him lined up, I would change my travel plans and go to Berlin and, and record with him after. Um, let's see. The books, films, I am so boring. I do not have summer summer reads or summer movies. Like I say, I don't go to the movies. I can't stand being around people on their phones. Um, Old Man's War by John Scalzi I read a couple of weeks ago. That was pretty light and summery as far as I'm concerned. Most everything else I read is for the show, so there's not a whole lot there. Um, I did just finish uh, Vertigo by W.G. Sebald. Uh, that was my non-podcast reading. Um, didn't like it. I've read Sebald's other three novels. This one, I, um, I was reading on my Kindle and that may have made it w even more inaccessible, but I could not connect to what was going on, why he was telling the stories that he was. Um, I've read the last 50 or 60 pages in hard copy and that worked better, but that was also the most linear section of the book. Um, if that was the first one I'd ever tried, I would not have tried Sebald again. Luckily, it's the last one of the, the four. I will still stand by, probably in descending order, Austerlitz, Rings of Saturn, Emigrants, and then Vertigo. Um, but yeah, I don't do a lot of reading or anything outside the podcast, so sorry, Vanessa. Now, Jim Ottaviani, who has a graphic biography of Stephen Hawking called Hawking, which came out last July from 1st 2nd, says... When we last talked, you all but demanded that I read J.A. Baker's The Peregrine. So I bought it, but confess that I haven't read it yet. 
other than right now, what is the best time to do so? Season, state of mind, whatever, and why? Also, if you've read it, how would you compare it to Helen McDonald's H is for Hawk? I have not read H is for Hawk. I've, it's been recommended to me multiple times. I know I should, so I'll try and get to it. Uh, the Peregrine, the best time is probably fall into winter, which is the season that's covered by the book. The Peregrine is about, uh, it, it's nature writing. It's a guy, it's a guy's chronicle of a single season of watching peregrine and falcon birds in eastern England in the 60s. It's a single season, but he spent 10 years uh, observing these birds. I've got a biography of this guy. I was hoping to interview the biographer during that UK trip that I mentioned, which is not going to happen. Um, the Peregrine is one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. The language is absolutely astonishing. You never learn anything about the guy writing it, um, either J.A. Baker or whether it's supposed to be a character. But that that person is deeply misanthropic, hates humanity, wants to be in nature, viewing these birds, being accepted almost by the birds. Um, apparently the guy was like, he worked in the division of motor vehicles in his little town in England, didn't own a car, couldn't drive, rode a bicycle, and just watched Peregrines for 10 seasons and wrote this book, died of cancer a couple of years after it came out. But if anything has changed my life, if any book has changed my life in recent years, it's that one. It changed how I see the world around me, what I what I hear and listen to when I'm walking through my neighborhood with all the, the trees and the woods around here. And I, I live in a exurb, not quite a suburb, a lot of woods where I live. And just, just it changed my frame of reference for everything. Um, that said, I also read it around the time that I read the Area X trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer, which will similarly reframe your brain. Um, read both of those together or read uh, the Peregrine and then jump into Area X. I keep a copy of the Peregrine on my nightstand, like I said. Um, somehow the misanthropy is comforting to me. The idea that someone could make beauty out of such such loathing for mankind and such a desire to, to experience nature and to capture it before at the time it was it was being destroyed by DDT and all of these these pollutants and chemicals we were pumping into the, the air. Um, that Baker was able to, to to spin gold out of that. It's it's just wonderful. So uh, read the Peregrine anytime, but fall into winter is when it's the the era the, the period that it's covering. So maybe that's the best time for it. Maria Alexander has a new short story collection: Twelve Tales Lie, One Tales True from Cemetery Dance. She asks, "What's the spookiest thing that's ever happened to you?" That's a toughie. Because I lead a, pre a pretty material-based life. I, I don't have a lot of spiritual thing going on. Um, not a lot of otherworldliness to my life. I would say that having the shit scared out of me by the trailer or the commercial for Magic with Anthony Perkins may have been the, the spookiest thing. Um, but I can't think of something that was like eerie ghost level. Now, maybe... Watching Shallow Grave um, for the first time, the the movie by Danny Boyle, uh, which is about three roommates who come across a significant amount of money and then begin um, turning on each other. Watching that when I was alone for a weekend eh, may have freaked me out a little bit. But um, yeah, otherwise, I don't have anything spooky, spooky in my life. I had a really wonderful moment recently summertime now and I took the dog out Bendico uh, to pee in the yard and then brought him back in but it was just getting on dusk and the, the fireflies were starting to, to really emit and I looked over at the a patch of woods off the side of our house and they were they were really going and and it was strangely beautiful and haunting not in a spooky sort of way, but just almost like fairies, I guess. Um, that was sort of entrancing. I guess that's as close as I come to, to spooky. I let things kind of kind of unfold beautifully. Sorry, Maria. I'm I'm too boring a human being. My bad. <laughs>
Now, Mary Fleener is next. Uh, Mary's latest book is Billy the Bee from Fanographics. Uh, you can order that through Fanographics.com. She's working on a new book, The Happy Hour, which will come from Fanographics also. It's a bar band memoir of her two years playing gigs in an Orange County dyke bar in the mid-'70s. And she won an Ink Pot Award at the San Diego Comic-Con this year. Uh, Mary asks, or she says, you travel a great deal. So I was wondering, have you ever been to the North or South Pole or Greenland since that's been in the news since America's going to buy it? If so, did you encounter any cartoonists there? No, no, and no. Haven't been to the North Pole, haven't been to the South Pole, um, haven't been to Greenland. If someone wants to send me there or we can raise a big crowdsourcing funding for a podcast from the Poles, I'm totally up for it. Um, for me, New Zealand is the farthest I've ever traveled, which is pretty, pretty south. Um, the neat thing for me when I did that, and this was fall of 2003, um, well, I, I mentioned it with the Hicksville thing when we talked about the most important graphic novels, et cetera, was the realization that um, in the southern hemisphere of the planet Earth in 2003, there were maybe five people who, if you said Gil Roth, would know who you were talking about. And at the time, I was going through a... A heartbreak of sorts. I was just uh, got a month or so before I would meet Amy, uh, who I married a year and a half later, two years later, and um, and it was just so liberating to be on the other side of the planet, to be that far away from yourself, and to just not have to be who you were. Nowadays, I don't know how doable that is, since we're all so social media profiled, et cetera. But, but yeah, on a personal level, it was, it was wonderful. Just, just being whoever around these people, sort of like running with my, my running group and not being asked about the podcast or lobbying or anything else. Um, I'm just, just another guy. So, uh, no, I haven't been to the polls, but yes, I've, I've traveled far enough to become anonymous, a little like Odysseus at the end of the Odyssey when he has to travel, um, with an oar to until he finds people who don't recognize what an oar is and think it's a fan. Um, I guess that's what I need to do next. Next question. Next huge set of questions comes from Stephen Nadler, who is a big supporter of mine on Patreon. Uh, Stephen does attempted bloggery, which is attempted bloggery dot blogspot dot com. And he's on Twitter as doc D O C underscore nad. NAD. So his questions are a little involved. We're going to go through them one by one. Hi, Gil. Why the aversion to interviewing young talent for your podcast? Wouldn't it have been infinitely valuable if someone, anyone, had recorded a conversation with a young Philip Roth while he was struggling with Portnoy? How about Thomas Pynchon when he had just published Entropy? Not that he likely would have sat for an interview even back then. The point is, artists can create signature work even when they're quite new to the game. If a young writer's work knocks your socks off, why not record a conversation right then and there? You can always have another sit down a few years later when the writer is more set in his or her ways and likely more guarded. This sounds like a case of reverse ageism to me. He's right. Uh, I've joked about this before that I'm averse to recording with anyone younger than me because I'm biased that anyone younger than me is much more accomplished, but they are. Um, that said, it's more complicated than that. Um, there are plenty of venues for younger artists. They, there are a lot of podcasts where these guys interview each other, and that's fine. Then there are hosts who are more in tune with their work and the context of their work and how it fits together. Generally, I'm more interested in conversations that are, that are around like the epicycles of people's lives and careers rather than a specific work of theirs, especially with fiction. I mean, I'll focus on a person's book, but I'm also interested in what they've seen, how how things have, have evolved around them, and what they've seen it through cycle after cycle of their work, their business, etc. I mean, I've joked that the person who has gone to college, MFA, worked in publishing, and is writing his first novel about college, MFA, and working in publishing is not something I'm interested in. That said, I do record with some younger cartoonists, and, and the show has turned me on to some of them. Uh, part of that is just the travel for the show, like going to SPX, a small press expo. I got to meet people like Leslie Stein, who whose comics I absolutely adore, and I never would have come across were I not there. So I pitched her, brought her onto the show. 
Andrea Tsurumi, who we'd mentioned earlier, I think her publisher reached out to me and I saw her stuff and said, oh, yeah, no, she definitely, we have to sit down and talk. Um, Katie Skelly is another one who, younger cartoonist, and one with a, a really set aesthetic, somebody who has, you know, thought about what she's doing really consciously as an artist. Um, so that stuff, yeah, I'm I'm floored by. That said, you know... Again, there are lots of places for young artists to get exposure. This podcast is not exactly the thing that's going to bring them fame or renown. And the younger you are, the less you've had, the less time you've had to read sometimes. And a good chunk of what my conversations are is sort of talking about our cultural touchstones. This comes up in the Simon Doonan thing also. We talk a little about responsibility for shepherding younger uh, gay people. And he says he doesn't feel that, but he did feel a sense of explaining to people in his occupation certain cultural references just so he could talk to them about these things, you know, getting them to watch Russ Meyer movies so that they could understand what he meant when he see, when he says, you know, I want a valley beyond the Valley of the Dolls vibe for this window that we're putting together. Um, so sometimes, yeah, with younger artists, if they're really young, I'm just not getting it. Um, I fear that I would not relate to them well. I would come off as condescending, and I don't want to spend time um, building the whole framework around how the conversation is going to go. Like I talked about that in terms of writing the questions, etc. But I don't want to have to be too self-conscious just in the process of talking to someone. Also, there is no young Philip Roth or young Thomas Pynchon nowadays, so I don't have to worry about that. Now, he next asks... Social media allows for ready promotion of podcasts like yours, as well as other valuable content. Yet you have walked away from your Facebook account, as some others have, and not necessarily without good reason. Has your departure from Facebook affected your ability to inform the public about your podcast? Who has suffered more from your withdrawal, Facebook or you? I would say it's my loss, um, partly for the promoting the show, which is largely all I did with Facebook for the last year before I finally nuked my account. I stopped reading the feed shortly after I lost uh, my dog, Rufus T. Firefly, in December of 2016. Um, I decided then I would just use the podcast to uh, or use Facebook to promote the podcast. And then more and more shittiness about Facebook's management came out. And once the... Um, using anti-Semitic tropes as part of their lobbying efforts to smear George Soros. I thought, you know, I'm providing them free content so they can sell my profile as an adverti to, to advertisers. I'm not seeing anything out of this. And frankly, the podcast had gotten big enough that if somebody wanted to promote it, a particular episode there, they can. Um, I still use Twitter, which, meh. Um, Instagram, which I know is owned by Facebook, but I managed to cut off every profile feeding part of Instagram. So basically it serves me up completely random ads that make no sense. Um, that I use because pictures and it's still a way to, to promote a little bit. But the whole boycott culture thing, like, you know, when it comes to, to Marvel movies or whatever, you know, it's your attention. You are the thing that they're, they're selling. So you endorse these things by using them. I used to watch pro wrestling, you know, not super devotedly wasn't crazy but I'd, I'd watch and then um the performer wrestler uh chris benoit who by all accounts was a great guy behind the scenes uh really helped younger talent and was was a good guy uh despite his his in the ring persona um lost his mind murdered his wife and child wandered around his house for 48 hours and then hung himself and the show went on they put on their next wwe that monday night and uh you know addressed the horrible tragedy but i thought this is endorsing you know pro wrestling which led to so many shots to the head that this guy turned into a monster and did the worst thing in the world and um I'm just not going to endorse it with my eyeballs and my time. Same with watching pro football. Um, it's basically watching guys make, you know, mincemeat of themselves and destroy their brains. Partly it's, I don't need to endorse that. Partly it's, hey, I get an extra three hours on Sundays that you other guys are, are missing out on. So it's, you know, boycott culture is a weird thing to manage and negotiate. We all have our, our um, compromises that we make in the process of that. But, 
that's where I am. And that ties into the social media thing. I'll use some stuff to still get the, the show out there, but really, you know, Facebook for what it's worth, you know, uh, if anything, it's more about losing contact with family members and, and old friends. But if it really mattered, they could email me. My phone number's out there. It, it's easy enough to contact me. So um, he writes, next, one thing I like about blogging is how readily the content is searchable. A podcast interview offers a vital interpersonal element, but the actual content of the conversation itself is hidden from search engines, at least for the present, Stephen writes. Wouldn't an online published transcript of your conversations make your content more readily searchable and also be a boon to those who prefer to read rather than listen? There might even be software now that can transcribe this, albeit with some errors, almost automatically. And he's right. Um, it's possible to do this. The problem is money and time. Uh, any decent transcription actually costs money. And there's still errors. I would have to go through. If you think I'm going to put something up unedited that either uh, a cheap transcribing firm in India or an AI put together, you have no idea how neurotic I really am. I could not possibly let something like that go up. And if I spent the amount of time it would take to proofread an hour long or hour plus conversation um, to put up a transcript of the episode, I would be taking up the time that I would otherwise be spending making a new episode. So it's a neat idea. I've had a couple episodes transcribed because I'm thinking of using them for my secret project, which will come up in a minute. But no, I'm not looking at it as a regular thing. Uh, I just don't think it's it's necessary for what I do. If you watch my episodes on YouTube, some of them have subtitles, so you could actually watch along with that. But each one would cost about 200 bucks to transcribe through their service or the services that they use. And I'm not getting enough Patreon money to, to justify that. Stephen writes, you frequently mention your wish list of Mount Rushmore podcast guests. Who are some of the artists, writers, and personalities you would most love to have on the virtual memory show? Do most of them know about your interest? Okay, um, my Mount Rushmore list, I've actually gotten a few of them on the show already, uh, like Clive James, Harold Bloom, Jules Pfeiffer, Gary Clark, the great musician, uh, Eddie Campbell, Jaime Hernandez, and very recently, Milton Glaser. Uh, a couple of them died. Um, Ricky Jay, David Carr, and Philip Roth, who was without doubt the, the person I most wanted to, to record with. And I did a whole episode or a mini episode about not recording with him and, and never even pitching him um, and why that still kills me. Uh, for ones who are still around, a couple of them know, but a couple of them know that I'm, I'm interested. Other ones I have not yet figured out how to reach out to in a way that wouldn't be immediately dismissed. Those include Tom Stoppard, uh, Robert Caro, Richard E. Grant, who does know, but we haven't managed to coordinate things. I have not managed to rope him into it, I mean. Fran Lebowitz, uh, Richard Price, the writer behind Clockers and a bunch of other great novels. Gillian Welsh and Dave Rawlings, who I think I have an in with, but I don't know how good they'd be in my sort of interview and conversation. Um, Janet Malcolm, whose publisher told me does not want to do interviews. Joan Didion, who no one can get. Joyce Carol Oates, who told me... Uh, get back to me in a few months. And in the intervening months, I'm just about ready to get back to her. I've interviewed like a dozen people she has worked with or is friends with. So I'm hoping I can sort of rope her in as a, a pincer sort of thing. And my podfather, Mark Marin. Mark grew up, or at least part of his childhood was spent two towns over from here. In fact, the town where I now run with the, the running group. Um, and I've sort of pitched him on this a few times. Once there was like a little feedback, but otherwise... Um, never. I would love to, to get him on just for a short conversation about what his show meant to me and what we've both learned from the, from sitting across the table from someone and talking as much as we both have or listening as much as we both have. David Carr, by the way, uh, among the deceased list, uh, was that great, uh, journalist at the, the New York times. He, uh, actually said, I'm busy now, but get back to me in a couple of months. And I did once, never heard back, figured I'd let it go, let it go. And then he dropped dead in the New York Times, um, uh, on the news, in the newsroom. Uh, that was one where I realized I need to keep up with nudging people, even if they think I'm being an asshole. 
Stephen next asks, why all the hush surrounding your quote-unquote secret project? Are you going it alone? You have a community of interested listeners. Why not bring the audience in to assist or encourage you? The secret project that I refer to as the thing that will go out to my patrons at Patreon whenever I get around to finishing the fucking thing is a zine. Uh, that's all it is. It's going to be a print collection of maybe 24 to 40 pages if I can figure out how to create enough content for it. I will put it out regularly. It was originally going to be called Anti-Sun after a weird counter-Earth epiphany I had a couple of years ago, but um, I recently realized that was way too dramatic, and I'm going to call it Haiku for Business Travelers. I have not finished the first issue. It is going to include uh, transcriptions of some of the, the podcast guests, poems, haiku for business travelers, um, some photography, personal essays, maybe fiction. I don't know. It's just going to take time. It all ties into the can Gill sit down and finish writing something. If I can, I will put it into haiku for business travelers, print up 16, 20, 24 pages, whatever it is, uh, print, fold, etc., and give it away to my Patreon and, and PayPal supporters and maybe sell it for a couple of bucks. The idea is not to have it online, um, to make it solely uh, a print artifact so that there is some thing of mine that just exists like that. So to that extent, no, I, um, I can't rely on a community of interested listeners. If I created some sort of artificial deadline so I had to produce it, then maybe that would help. My thought is maybe down the line, some of the cartoonists I've, I've recorded with would contribute art. I'd pay, uh, contribute art for it also, and we could make it a, a, a thing, I guess. But there's already other things out there, um, other zines out there that are much more comprehensive than, than this. The pinnacle of that, of course, is the, the zine Mineshaft, which you really need to read, and Robert Crumb and Mary Fleener. And P oh, Crumb. Crumb is on my list of, of Mount Rushmore people, too. I need to try to figure out a way to get him. But Crumb, Mary Fleener, and uh, Drew Friedman and some other past guests are contributors to Mineshaft. You should look up that zine, order a whole bunch of back issues, because it's absolutely wonderful. So anyway, my secret project is Haiku for Business Travelers. Um, I will try to find a way to finish a first issue, and it will show up in your, your mailbox someday, Stephen. His next question, I told you we had a whole bunch. Recently, we learned that Mad Magazine will no longer be publishing new material. Newspapers and magazines have been in decline for decades. With so much free content available online, do you think print media will continue to resonate with readers? Does satire have a future? When I talked about my history in uh, in pharma, etc., I talked about quitting my gig as the editor of Contract Pharma because the business-to-business -business magazine model was dying. And that's free circulation. The magazine doesn't cost anything for the readers. It's all paid for by advertisers. Um, I think a lot of um, we've all seen newspapers and magazines, et cetera, are, are disintegrating. Partly that's for extraneous uh, economic pressures that magazines or newspapers could be profitable on their own, but tend to have been bought up by hedge funds that are looking to make back gigantic, um, gigantic returns or private equity houses that are trying to make back oversized returns and as such are just going to strip the thing for its resources and, and go. But answering Stephen's question, I do think print media will continue to resonate with readers. The problem is I think there are going to be fewer and fewer people who qualify as readers. I don't mean everybody's reading on screen. It's not right. I mean, people read less. They read deeply less. Um, now, does satire have a future? As long as Michael Gerber is still out there making the American bystander, satire still has a future. Uh, Michael sent a question during the middle of this session to ask, how did the episode go? That is your answer, Michael. As long as you keep making the American bystander and maybe take over Mad Magazine and, and recreate that, satire has a home and has a future. Stephen's next question, and this is his last full one. You spend 10 years writing a novel. It can be a critical success or a commercial success, but not both. Which one would you choose? I say, Stephen, false equivalence, because all of that implies that I'm even capable of spending 10 years writing a novel. That said, I would go with commercial success because uh, critics are a bunch of boobs. Um, their opinions will change over the years, so what was critically disdained might be liked or vice versa down the line, and the money would be nice. Now, uh, he next has a lightning round of questions, which some of which mirror mine. Bleak House or Middlemarch? 
Middlemarch. Uh, it's got more of a complete life in it. Bleak House is more of a cosmology. Tolstoy or Dostoevsky? Uh, right now, Dostoevsky, because it's been too long since I've read him and have to get back to him. But I could say Tolstoy based on the last episode I just recorded, which is going to air in a few weeks. But forget it. Dostoevsky. Dickens or Trollope? I've never read Trollope, so Dickens. Arthur Rackham or Maurice Sendak? I never actually read either of them as a kid. No preference. Beatles or Rolling Stones? Uh, Beatles, because Childhood, Sgt. Pepper's uh, was a constant soundtrack for me, as well as, and this will sound horrible, Stars on 45, the Swedish uh, cover band that did a disco cover of a whole bunch of Beatles songs, was unfortunately in heavy fucking rotation in my childhood. So Beatles over Stones. Dylan or Springsteen? Springsteen. I'm from New Jersey. Can't answer anything else. Uh, Charles Adams or Edward Gorey? Adams, because the Adams Family pinball machine is one of the single greatest inventions of mankind's history. Marvel or DC? I don't know what those are. Uh, Betty or Veronica? Veronica, no comment. Uh, hot Tub Time Machine or DeLorean? DeLorean, because you do not get pruny fingers from driving a DeLorean. You get pruny fingers from spending too much time in a hot tub. Picard or Kirk? Uh, Picard, because of uh, Patrick Stewart's role in Blunt Talk, the Jonathan Ames TV show, he wins hands down over anything William Shatner does. And he had a final question. Do you think your podcast will be available to listeners in 50 years? Have you given any thought to your legacy? Have you made any provision for the podcast episodes to live on in perpetuity, either online or in a brick and mortar library somewhere? No, I haven't thought about any of that. Um, I do think a little about the meaning it has for people that they get to listen to it. I've told a story about Sandy McClatchy's um, sisters getting to listen to the episode we did that I told them about at Sandy's memorial service. And that was, that was a wonderful moment because it was a gift to them of something they, they didn't know existed. They get to hear their, their brother again after he was gone. But I have not thought about my legacy. At the Pharmaceutical Trade Association, they have been on my ass about, and because this is a one-man trade association, about um, not succession planning, but what happens if Gil gets hit by a truck planning. Um, so I have to take more care of that stuff, too. And that's legit fiduciary stuff um, where, I, where they know where the checks are, what all the passwords are, how to get a, you know, access to everything. Um, so I've done a bad job of that. There are backups of all my files. Unfortunately, they're all here in the house. So if that gets hit by lightning again and we get scorched, they're all gone. I should get a safe deposit box and store stuff elsewhere. The final uh, editions of every podcast are hosted by Libsyn somewhere else. But all the, the raw files and all the, the notes of materials and everything, that's all on a couple of uh, portable drives here as well as a Drobo unit. Um. I guess I should think about that. If anybody has ideas for, like, how to host this stuff and, you know, make it some sort of permanent archive, which, in fact, Simon Doonan brought up that, you know, the Smithsonian or somebody should be interested in, in what I'm doing and, and preserving this. Um, I guess we should do that. Last couple questions. And these are all short ones now um, because we've gotten through the Stephen Nadler mega set of questions, which I was willing to answer because Stephen's been such a great supporter of the show through Patreon. Next questioner or next guest is Charles Blackstone, author of Vintage Attraction. He says, my question, if you could have won one thing from the Philip Roth auction for his estate, what would it have been and why? And I got to say, I went through everything in the uh, the website and there was hundreds and hundreds of things um, from his estate that were up for sale. Nothing really jumped out at me. Um, maybe a typewriter if either of his um, lecterns or standing desks were part of the auction, I probably would have bid more money than I should have on those. Neither one was there from the beginning, so I assume those were part of his, his testament. He'd already willed those to, to people. So I guess a typewriter would have made sense. There wasn't anything to me that said, oh, this is a, a Philip Roth thing. Yeah, that said, I have one of Joe Chardello's um, drawings to the New York Times book review of Philip Roth on my, my wall of art as you come into my house. Um, that and his Henry Miller, and I've got a few other things from other, other artists. Um, I see it every day when I, I walk up or down the stairs, and it, it's, it's something. But um, he also asks as a follow-up, um, Charles does, who would win, Claire Bloom or Mia Farrow? I think Mia is younger and still more fit, so she'd probably take out Claire Bloom, but no thought on that otherwise. 
Lauren Weinstein, who is the cartoonist behind Normal Person, uh, the amazing strip, being an artist and a mother and a lot more, and the winner of the Slate CCS Awards, which I was really happy about, asks, how do you stop the world from spiraling out of control? And I assume that's, you know, how do you deal with this contemporary moment that we're in? And um, when I did this Ask Me Anything for episode number 100, uh, one of the questions I got, and this this semi-answers it, is uh, one of the questions I got back then was, what are your keys to productivity? And at the time I said, I don't drink, I've got no social life, and I don't have kids. Not having kids is the most important thing, I said, um, because you'll spend, if you're a decent parent, you'll spend all your time helping them. So get rid of your kids. Don't have them, um, you know, put them up for adoption, whatever. That will make you much more productive. Nobody has taken me up on that. That said, I think not having kids helps a little for me in terms of not spiraling, not how do I stop the world from spiraling out of control? Um, the recent anxiety slash dread slash, okay, maybe we'll sort of call it depression that I went through early this summer, I think was when the world started to get to me a little too much. The fact that I don't have kids, though, means I'm not constantly confronted by the, the present and future horror that we're creating or that we're abetting or that we're not fighting off hard enough. Um, so, yeah, for someone like Lauren, who is a mother and a good parent, I'm sure this is it's much more sensitive for her. She is much more sensitive to everything that's horrible that's going on. I'm sensitive to it. It gets to me, but it's not reflected back at me in the face of my, my own children. So, Lauren, my advice to you is get rid of your kids. That is how you can stop the world from spiraling out of control. Um, the last question, which I've been holding off on, comes from David Shields. David has recently produced the documentary Lynch, a history uh, feature. It's all about Marshawn Lynch, a uh, former Seattle Seahawk, and it's holding a press screening at School of Visual Arts in New York, August 26th and 27th. It's been around to a couple of festivals. David's question, how has being conventionally good looking affected your life, Gil? And you can see why I held off on that one till the very end here. Um... That's a good question. I was not good looking when I was young. Um, I've gotten better looking as I've gotten older. Some, including a, a recent guest, think I've gotten a little too skinny from all the running and that my face is starting to waste away. I'll live with that. Um, but it helps. We live in a looks, it looks great impressions. And um, early on, I was, I, I met with a guest who thought just because some podcaster coming over from New Jersey assumed I was going to be a bridge troll, this guest was sort of taken aback that I was good looking and well dressed when we we met. Um, it does help. I, I've I've had guests mention to other guests that you know I wasn't expecting a well dressed, good looking guy to show up. It was, you know, easier. I think what it does, it makes it easier for me to talk to people, to keep eye contact. All of this sounds self aggrandizing and weird. I'm sorry to to bring it up or to make it the, the very last thing we talk about or that I talk about. Um because usually I just get the having a great radio voice thing, which is a bit worn out because I have done this in a single take and we're approaching the two hour mark. Um but being good looking opens doors for people. Even at my day job, you know, if I walk into a congressional office and look presentable and, and you know, dress well and, and, you know, look nice, it helps if I come in, you know, bedraggled or, you know, if I was uh, uglier than I am, um, might create a worse impression, might, you know, make it more difficult to just get that immediate rapport with people. And yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe people sort of trust that I will be um, not honest, but, you know, talk toable that I'll be relatable, um, just by not, not being hideous and grotesque. Um, so that was sort of the, the weird last question that I've been holding off on, um, in terms of my looks. I will be recording with David again shortly after the Marshawn Lynch uh, uh, thing, and I will try and throw this question back at him and see what he thinks about looks and how that impacts um, how one gets by. 
So anyway, I want to thank whoever the hell stuck around for the very end of this episode. I want to thank all of my past guests and uh, my Patreon and PayPal supporters for sending in questions. Uh, my upcoming guests like Kate uh, and, and Caleb Crane, who also did. Um, I apologize for not having a, a real guest this time around. I'm sorry you had to put up with, you know, Gil talking about himself for two hours. I'm sorry I wasn't able to answer Tom Spurgeon's question about changes between the comics side and the prose side and how those relate to each other. But I'm no longer sure those are good differentiators to have. I'm, I'm starting to feel in some respects, as I've talked through this stuff, that it's um, that that's false, that there are a couple of other crenellations and weirdnesses. I mean, there's some musicians who are part of this. There are illustrators who seem to straddle the line between being a, a writer and being a, a comics artist. Um, that makes it there's a much more granularity, I guess, to the, the show, which to me is an absolute joy, getting all these people from so many different fields and, and areas and different ways of, of creating art. Anyway, that's the show for this week. Thank you, everyone, for, for being part of it. I promise I will not do this again for a long time. Maybe someone will interview me, a single interviewer someday, but I'm not holding out hope for that. And um, I will see you next week with Caleb Crane, who has the new novel coming out called Overthrow, which I enjoy the living hell out of. Thanks. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.